الله أكبر الله أكبر Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Islamic Center at New York University podcast coming to you straight from the heart of New York City. We're building an amazing Muslim community here at ICNYU where everyone is welcomed and respected no matter where you're from or where you're at. This is the place to be. So open your ears and your heart and come along with us on another life-changing journey. Bismillah. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا مولاي يا رسول الله وعلى أهل بيتك المذلومين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا مولاي مولاي وابن مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة العمة يا غريب يا مذلوم يا أتشان كربلا ما خاب من تمسك بكم والعمنا من لجأ إليكم سادتي يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا ماكم فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق والأستق القائلين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إنا نحن نزلنا الذكر وإن له لحافظون أمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد In a hadith from the Prophet of God he states إن أشراف أمتي حملت القرآن وأصحاب الليل. He says, surely the most noble of my ummah are those who are the carriers of the Quran and those who spend their nights in worship and obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Although we talk about the various character traits of what it means to be an ummah or what it means to be a member of the ummah of the greatest of God's creations, in this hadith, as well as many other, naturally there's a strong emphasis on important practices and actions and rituals embedded within our tradition. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says within the whole Quran, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَشِئُونَ That surely the believers are successful. And then he outlines the characteristics and the qualities of the believers. And he says the first amongst them are those who pray. And in that famous hadith, it states, "In qubilat qubila ma sewaha wa in ruddat rudda ma sewaha." That if your prayers are accepted, then all of your other deeds are accepted, and if your prayers are rejected, then all of your other deeds are rejected. There is a need to go back and to emphasize, in addition to the latter half of the thaqalain that the Prophet ﷺ left behind for us, in nitarik fikum at thaqalain that we mentioned a couple of nights ago, we have a lot of love. And we have a lot of fidelity and we demonstrate with a lot of emotion our intense involvement, our intense connection and that link that we have with the Prophet and his family And that's good and we need to improve that by means of our action, by means of our ritual, by means of our practice like we spoke about in night number one. But in addition to that, we can't neglect the former part of the tradition of the Prophet of God in which he emphasizes the importance of the whole Qur'an. And I talk about prayers, and I talk about acts of ritual, and acts of worship, because for many of us, we neglect that, and we focus upon Ahlul Bayt salam, oftentimes again, completely in opposition to what it is that they preached. Where Ahlul Bayt salam, they emphasize the importance of being amongst those who read the Qur'an, amongst those who reflect upon the Qur'an, amongst those who utilize the Qur'an as their means of guidance, every single day. And I want you to look within yourself for just a moment, and I look within myself, and I don't mean this as any sort of statement of judgment or any means for anyone to self-deprecate themselves, but for a moment, ask yourself, when is the last time that I truly engage the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? 
We're three, four months now divorced from the month of Ramadan. Someone says, I used to read the Quran in the month of Ramadan. Good. What have you done in the last several months? Or even if you take a look at your last week, how much have you engaged in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When the hadith of the Prophet salam says, Inna ashraf ummati hamalat al-Quran, that the most noble of my community are firstly and foremostly the carriers of the Quran and secondly those who worship God in the night, it's important that we ask ourselves, am I the one who carries the whole Quran? Am I someone who upholds the value of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Every single one of us probably carry the whole Quran in our pocket, on our iPhones. But at the end of the day, I want you to go to your usage sort of section on your phone and check to see how often you take a look and you read the verses of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or if you have to click it and it re-downloads because you haven't opened it in such a long time, well, you need to look within yourself and understand that, wait a minute, I'm doing something that is not exactly in walking in the footsteps of my master Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam. So we come here and we weep for Sayyid al-Shuhada about Abdullah al Hussein. yet on the night of Ashura, you know, and I'll say this again on the night of Ashura itself, that on the 9th of Muharram, the army of Umar bin Sa'ad was ready to begin the battle at the time of Asr prayers. And I want you to just put this in perspective for you for just one moment. And for those of you who have read the Maqtal literature, you will know that Umar bin Sa'ad was ready to fight the army of Imam al-Hussein on the 9th, or on the 9th, excuse me, around the time of Asr prayers. Strategically, from the side of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam, wouldn't it have been more strategic? When did water get stopped to the tents of Imam al-Hussein? On the 7th of Muharram, 7th or the 8th of Muharram. If Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam had opted to fight 12 or 14 hours earlier, strategically, they would have more energy. No? Number one. Number two, they would have fought in the evening, not under the blazing sun of the desert. More strategic as well. But what does Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam tell Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas to tell the army of Amr bin Sa'ad? He says, give us till the morning لِأَنِّي أُحِبَّ السَّرَاتِ وَقَرَاءَتْ كِتَابِ اللَّهِ He says, because I love to pray and I love to recite the Book of God. So give me this last eve so that I can pray and so that I can recite the whole Qur'an. What is all this about anyway? What is all this about? What is Majlis about? What is Matam about? What is the poetry about? What is all of this about? If it's not about Qur'an. If it's not about that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed into the heart of the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a means to drive us out of darkness into light, out of ignorance into knowledge, it's the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is really important then, that we utilize these nights and days in our remembrance of the epic tragedy of the family of the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam but utilize it as an inspiration and as a motivation for us to truly again walk in their sacred footsteps and be amongst those who improve in our prayers during these days, amongst those who improve in our acts of worship during these nights. If you've never worshipped God in the darkness of night by performing Salatul Layl, for instance, then you do so during the course of these nights because we take inspiration from them, alayhim If we haven't engaged the whole Qur'an the way that we ought to engage, the Book of God, then these are the nights where we begin to initiate that relationship with the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I say all of this in order to emphasize or to reflect upon a really, really important question that many people engage, particularly polemically, but nonetheless super important for us to recognize exactly how we can respond to some of these questions that many may present to us as followers of the Prophet and his family, alayhim as a question as simple as, do Shias believe in the same Qur'an as other Muslims? Someone says, that's pretty ridiculous. We're all, we're all here. The majority of us are in this room, are already Shi'i, and we already know that we have the same exact Qur'an as everyone else. Like we might know that reality, at the end of the day, there are plenty of people who will present a whole host of different questions to us throughout our journeys, throughout our spiritual relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, throughout the ups and downs that we go through during the course of our life, questioning the validity of this claim that we make that the Qur'an of the Shia is the same as the Qur'an of anyone and everyone else. 
Again, it might sound totally absurd, but let me tell you a really, really quick anecdote. I work at this university for the last six years. I lead a community of Shia students and community members for the last several years. I teach courses in Islamic law and Islamic spirituality at this fine institution. With all of that, still I come into this prayer space and still I engage with students all across the country who tell me, do you really believe in the same Quran that we do or is it just something that you read and recite in front of us? As recently as a couple of months ago, I was asked to visit a university to give a talk about what do Shias believe. And a student who is 22 years old, uh, a, 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 a student who is majoring in Islamic studies, came to me after the program and said, I know you mentioned that you believe in the same Quran as we do, but can I ask you a question? I said, sure. They said, don't you also believe in other Qurans, like the Quran of Fatima, or the Quran of Ali, or the Quran of Hassan? I said, no, we don't believe in any of these things. The Quran is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They said then, what is the Mus'haf of Fatima? Or what is the Mus'haf of Ali ibn Abi Talib? Most of you might have heard these terminologies. And so I thought that for this evening, insha'Allah ta'ala, I wanted to offer you all some insight in regards to what exactly are these different textbooks or different classical works that we have within our tradition and how we can eradicate all of the misconceptions internally, first of all, amongst followers of Ahlul Bayt salam, but also for those of us who might not have been ever exposed to what Shi'i theology is all about or what Shia Muslims believe in the first place. And I want to respond to this question of do Shias believe in the same Quran in three different dimensions. Firstly and foremostly, what is the Shia stance on the whole Quran? Number two, what is the Mus'haf of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salatu salam? And thirdly, what is the Mus'haf of Ali ibn Abi Talib? Peace and blessings be upon him. So let's go right into dimension number one of our discussion for this evening. Please recite one salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. What do Shias believe about the whole Qur'an? The whole Qur'an is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as revealed to the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. It is the absolute final word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as revealed to him in the Arabic language. While we might be exposed to various different chat translations and different interpretations, none of those are the word of God. The only thing that is truly the word of God is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as revealed to the Prophet salam in the Arabic language. If you go to a mosque in Kerbala, Iraq, or to Indonesia, or you go to Meshhad, or you go to Paris, or you go to London, or you go to New York City, or if you go to any mosque, be they a Shi'i mosque or a Sunni mosque, in the Masajid Allah, all of the mosques are for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyway, if you go to any home of a Shi'i or a Sunni, and if you ask them for a copy of the Qur'an, the Qur'an is identical and the Qur'an is the same. And the belief amongst Muslims unanimously is that that book is a perfect book. That that book is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the word of God, again, as revealed to the greatest of God's creations. There is no mistake in it, there is no error in it, because the one revealing it is perfect, and the one who he revealed it to in human form is perfect. That is, of course, our Prophet. The Quran that we have in front of us is 114 chapters, beginning with Surah Al Fatiha and concluding with Surah An Nas. It has upwards of 6,000 some odd verses, and like we know that the whole Quran is revealed partially in Mecca and the latter portion in the city of Medina. The form, former portion of the whole Quran which was revealed in Mecca is during the beginning of the prophetic message of our Prophet ﷺ, where he begins to preach to his community about common core values, that of belief in one God, that of belief in the day of judgment, that of the need to be kind to our neighbors and to our parents and to have morality and to have virtue and thereafter, once the Prophet of God السلام, establishes his government within the holy city of Medina, we find that law, that legislation, the jurisprudence now is presented in the ayat that are presented or revealed in the holy city of Medina. 
We talk, we talk about Meccan verses, we talk about Medani verses. At the end of the day, all of these verses, again, make up the whole Qur'an. As elementary, and as basic, and as not performance of taqiyya that I possibly can, this is what we believe about the whole Qur'an. That was sarcastic, by the way. Yeah, I get it. Then. <laughs> Before, that famous TV channel takes this part out and says, look what this guy just said. So again, we believe in the same Qur'an as anyone. What do Shia Muslims believe, or do Shia Muslims believe, that the Qur'an was distorted in any way? If you go ahead and take a look at Sunni narrations as well as Shi'i narrations, Muslim narrations more broadly, there are numerous isolated reports that talk about the fact that the Qur'an has been distorted, that the Qur'an has this many verses. But in reality, this many verses were lost. And if you go and take a look, at any Islamophobe in the world today, Robert Spencer, who I spoke about a couple of days ago, or many other academics who have this animosity toward the religion of Islam, they love to pull out a whole host of these isolated reports amongst different Muslim theological groups in order to demonstrate, look, Muslims don't even believe that the Qur'an that they have in front of them is perfect because it's been distorted by people and by generations and so much of it was lost in the first place. So how do then do we respond toward these claims? Shia, like Sunni Adama, for centuries have responded to these claims by stating something very simple. That again, that the Qur'an that we have in front of us today is the Qur'an of the Prophet of God sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And that every single one of these reports that suggests that the Qur'an has been distorted, that the Qur'an has additions to it that have been lost, or that the Qur'an has certain aspects of it that have been added, which really, in reality, no one particularly claims. At the end of the day, no one, except for a really small fringe minority amongst Muslims of the past, believed in this in the first place. And if you go toward the school of Ahlul Bayt, and we talk about the giants from our scholarship, that of Sheikh al-Saduq, that of Sayyid Murtada, that of Sheikh al-Mufid, that of Sheikh Al-Ta'ifa Al-Tusi, every single one of them flat out reject that the Qur'an was tampered with in any way possible. And they cite numerous evidences, the most important of them, the verse of the whole Qur'an, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, Inna nahnu nazalna dhikr wa inna lahu lahafidun. What does God say in this verse? He says, surely we are the ones who reveal this remembrance. The Qur'an, one of its titles is the remembrance. Why? Because it reminds us. It reminds us of who we are. It reminds us of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. It reminds us of who we should be. It reminds us of a covenant that we made with God in the past. إِنَّ نَحْنُ نَزَّلْنَا الذِّكْرِ Surely we reveal this remembrance. وَإِنَّ لَهُ لَهَافِذُونَ And surely we will be the one who protects it. Meaning it's the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He is the protector of the whole Qur'an. Now when God says something as direct and as clear as that, in reality when someone says that Shias don't believe in the same Qur'an, what they're actually saying is that God didn't do His job. right? In reality, because they're saying, look, these people believe in a different Qur'an. What they're really doing is saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't do His job of protecting the whole Qur'an. Na'udhu billahi min dhalik. And of course we know that that's not accurate. So I will say this, and I will say this, and I will say this again. When it comes toward the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, we believe in its infallibility. We believe in its perfection. We believe that it was, and it is the word of God as revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa wasallam. And we, in addition to that, have a sense of responsibility to be amongst those who engage with the book of God better. It's a responsibility. It is the word of God as revealed to us. When we want to know how God speaks to you and I, we open up the whole Qur'an, as we've taught when we were kids. And if we want to be amongst those who speak to God, then we stand in Salat. It is the way that God communicates directly to us. And really, if you open up your heart toward the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you try from tonight, I want to read five verses, I want to read for five minutes a day. You open up the Qur'an, some of it's not going to make any sense. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be challenging to navigate. But what science, what course of study is easy the first day when you try? I ask you, my friends, that utilize these nights for five minutes a day to recite the whole Qur'an. How long is that going to take? Five minutes. Five minutes, that's all. 
And if five minutes is too much, then start with two and a half minutes a day. Two and a half minutes, that's all. Try to make this commitment that every single day, no matter what I'm going through, no matter how difficult my day is, no matter what my mind, where my mind is at, no matter how inclined I am to religion or not, no matter how distant I am from my spirituality or no, two and a half minutes, I'm going to dedicate that to reciting the whole Qur'an. I'm going to read the verse, I'm going to read the translation, and I'm going to ponder upon it. Can everyone commit two and a half minutes a day? Can we do that? Is that too much? Let's make it two minutes a day. We're negotiating. You guys are negotiating well since everyone's staring at me. Two minutes a day. 100. Put on a timer if you have to. Even if it means that you read three or four or five verses and you read those translations and you contemplate upon them, I promise you, I guarantee you that you will start to see the benefit immediately. Then you grow from there. You don't make it two minutes. You make it two and a half minutes. Then from two and a half minutes, you make it three minutes. You make small strides in your life and you find that these incremental measures of growth, they really allow for ourselves to find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that God reveals himself to us a little bit every single time that we engage the book of Allah Azza wa Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Very good. This brings me then toward dimension number two of the discussion. If we believe in the identical Qur'an, to what all other Muslims believe, then why do we have an abundance of hadith report that speak to different texts, specifically a text known as the Mus'haf of Fatima? And what exactly is the Mus'haf of Fatima? Many people, when they want to engage with followers of Ahlul Bayt in polemics, amongst the first things that they state is that Shias believe that the Qur'an was revealed to the Prophet but that the Qur'an was also revealed to Fatima alayhi salam, which of course we don't believe. I'll respond to this particular claim in a hadith narrated in Kitab al-Kafi of Shaykh al-Kulayni on the authority of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wassalam. And let me just say this really, really quickly again. Like I mentioned the other night, it's really, really important for us to once in a while go back to our hadith, reflect upon them, learn from them, and take benefit from them. This hadith from Kitab al-Kafi, it states, إن فاطمة مكثت بعد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله خمسة وسبعين يوما وكان دخلها حزن شديد على أبيها. That for Lady Fatima عليها الصلاة والسلام, that after she, after the Messenger of God صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم had departed this dunya, she grieved for seventy-five days until the day of her death. And this grief intensified daily to the extent وَكَانَ جِبْرَائِيلَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ يَأْتِيهَا فَيُحَسِّنْ عَزَاءَهَا عَلَىٰ أَبِيهَا وَيُطَيِّبْ نَفْسَهَا وَيُخَبِّرُهَا عَنْ أَبِيهَا وَمَكَانِهِ وَيُخَبِّرُهَا بِمَا يَكُونْ بَعْدَهَا فِي ذُرِّيَّتِهَا وَكَانَ عَلِيٍّ يَكْتُبْ ذَلِكَ فَهَذَا مُصْحَفُ فَاطِمَةً that Lady Fatima alayhi salam grieved for 75 days after the passing of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wasallam. And that as her grief intensified, Jibra'il alayhi salam descended to her in order to console her. And in consoling the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, Jibra'il told Lady Fatima alayhi salam to be patient and told her about the position of her father in Jannah which would bring solace to the heart of Lady Fatima alayhi salam. In addition to that, Jibra'il would inform Fatima to Zahra of that which was going to happen to her children. And Ali alayhi salam would write this down. And this is the Mus'haf of Fatima. This is the words of Muhammad Sadiq. Someone says, okay, that's not the Quran, is it? But wait a minute, we have some problems here. What are the problems? What's the first question that someone might pose about this? Jibra'il can talk to another human being. Jibra'il can reveal something to somebody who is not a prophet. And we respond to that very simply. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ That we reveal to the mother of Musa alayhi salam. When the mother of Moses, peace and blessings be upon her, and Musa alayhi salam, peace and blessings be upon him, was born, we know that the Pharaoh sought to eradicate every male child from Egypt. What did she do? 
She takes that child, puts him into this little basket, and puts him into the river, knowing again, or having this sense of contentment and certainty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was going to protect her child. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ And we revealed to the mother of Moses, is the mother of Moses a prophet? No. What mother, what parent, what sane adult would take their child who's a newborn and put them in a basket and throw them into the river and have contentment and conviction that God is going to protect them? Nobody. But what is unique about the mother of Musa السلام, is that she receives a revelation. وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ Number one. Number two, who came to marry the mother of Jesus, Maryam والسلام, to inform her that she was going to have a child without having a husband? Who? Have there been instances in the past where angels or revelation has been given to creations other than prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Yes. So what's the harm here when we're talking not about any woman, but we're talking about Sayyidatun Nisa Adami, the greatest of the women of the worlds. Sayyidatun Nisa Ahl al Jannah, the leader of the women of paradise, the daughter of the Messenger of God, Fatima Bid'atum Minni, that Fatima is a part of me. Fatima Ruhilati Bayna Jambaik. That Fatima is the soul which rests between my two shoulders. What's the harm? What's the issue? Number one. The second part of this is the fact that Jibrail in this report, someone might state, that Jibrail informs her of the station of her father Rasulullah and that which will take place to her children thereafter. Someone says, how can someone other than the Prophet of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam have knowledge of the future? Someone might ask the question. The response is number one, when the Prophet of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam he receives knowledge of the future, doesn't he tell some of his companions? And those are recorded in the books of history today. We know what is going to happen, for instance, the end of times. So are we also have access to the knowledge of the unseen that we have still not seen? We also have access to it, number one. Number two, there is a belief amongst non-Shias as well that some individuals who reach a high level in their understanding and in their ma'rafa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can receive unique knowledge from the metaphysical world that allows for them to tell the future. Okay, if you can believe that, then why is it so difficult for you to believe? Again, the greatest of God's creation, His daughter who we are commanded to love and be in a state of obedience to can receive that knowledge as well. What's the issue here? So in other words, there's no issue. The Mus'haf of Fatimah al-Zahra salam, was a divinely instructed revelation from the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Lady Fatima alayhi salam that doesn't contain verses of the Qur'an, but in reality offers her a sense of solace and tells her what is going to happen to her children, the sons of Ali and Fatima, while Ali ibn Abi Talib was present with, with his wife Fatima, he would write down this particular narration as Jibra'il was narrating it to Lady Fatima, and this became a book that was transmitted from Ali to Hassan, Hassan to Hussein, through the line of the Imams, Wahaba Mus'haf Fatima. And this is the book of Fatima as narrated by Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salatu Muhammad wa Muhammad. Very good. That moves us then to the third dimension of the discussion. If we have checked off the box with regards to the Mus'haf of Fatima, then what is the Mus'haf of Ali alayhi salatu And let me just say this, the word Mus'haf in the Arabic language literally means a collection of pages or a book. When you take that copy of the Qur'an that is on these bookshelves and you hold the Qur'an in and of itself, it's actually known as a Mus'haf. So when the word Mus'haf is thrown around in the way that it is in the reports, many people, they assume that it means what it means to them today, linguistically. So they say, the Mus'haf of Fatima, meaning it's the Mus'haf of Fatima, another Qur'an. If I have my own copy of the Qur'an in my home, which is a Mus'haf, and I write my name in it, is there anything wrong in that? It's the Mus'haf of Fayyaz, what's the big deal in the first place, right? Anyhow, what is then the Mus'haf of Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salatu wasalam? Did Imam Ali, salamullah alayhi, have his own Qur'an as well? Yes, he did, salamullah alayhi. But what was the Qur'an of Ali, alayhi salam? 
After the passing of the Prophet والسلام, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, like many of us have heard in the past, he imposed upon himself a restriction from engaging with the larger Muslim community after his authority was taken from him. And he committed to spending the entirety of days in his home compiling the whole Qur'an as is narrated within the books of history. When people hear this language, they say Ali ibn Abi Talib was compiling the Qur'an. That means he might have a different Qur'an than the one that was compiled otherwise. No. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, according to different of reports, was in his home for a minimum of three days and refused to leave the home to perform anything other than to take the whole Qur'an and begin to gather the whole Qur'an by taking it and writing down reports and narrations on its margins that supported or that offered us insight with regards to what verses were revealed for what particular reason. In other words, what Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib did was that he wrote a commentary of the whole Qur'an. And he would take, for instance, Surah Al-Fatiha, Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah An-Nisa, Surah Al-Ma'idah, Surah Al-Imran, Surah Yasin, Surah Al-Rahman, and he would write next to the beginning of that particular chapter when that particular chapter was revealed in chronological order. If you take a look today, and you try to understand what was the, what's the first chapter of the whole Qur'an that was revealed in the first place? Surah Alaq, Iqra, Bismi Rabbika Alladhi, Khalaq. Over here, there's a lot of debate over, for instance, what is the second chapter of the Qur'an? What is the third chapter of the Qur'an? We have some sort of consensus, but we're not entirely unanimous amongst Muslims about the chronological order of revelation of the whole Qur'an. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib perhaps believed and knew that this was going to be a problem later on. So what does he do? He gathers together the whole Qur'an and he places it or he instructs the reader in terms of when and how that Qur'an was revealed. And across the entirety of the Qur'an, he would write, and this verse was revealed at this particular time. And this verse was revealed for these people. Today we have commentators of the whole Qur'an. For those of you who come to our Qur'an lessons, for instance, if you were to study the tafsir of the whole Qur'an, we say, according to some opinions, it's this. According to some opinion, it might mean this. According to some opinion, it means this. According to Ali ibn Abi Talib, it meant this. Because Ali ibn Abi Talib was exposed to the knowledge from whom? From Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Perfect! This is the Musaf of Ali, and if we have the Qur'an of Ali, all of our problems are gone. Where's the Qur'an of Ali? Alayhi salatu wasalam. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, after some months, he took this Qur'an of his with all of its notes and with all of its information and all of its ilm, and he brought it to the Caliphate, and he says, I want you to take this Qur'an and I want you to utilize it and share it with the Muslim community. They looked at the Qur'an for some days and they said, Oh Ali, we're sorry, we can't accept it. Why can't you accept it? We can't accept what's in the margins. In other words, for short, you get what I'm saying. That we can't accept your interpretation, O oh Ali, of the Qur'an. Baba, this is not the interpretation of Ali ibn Abi Talib. What did we say yesterday? What did we say the other day? The interpretation of Ali ibn Abi Talib is that which was taught to him by whom? By Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So with that, we lose the Mus'haf of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Someone says then in our books of hadith, in books of literature, we also have something known as Sahifa to Ali. Mus'haf Ali, this Qur'an of Ali. What is the Sahifa of Ali then? The manuscript, so to say, of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And you find this within the books of hadith as well. This is a quick sort of bonus point for you all. The Sahifa of Ali ibn Abi Talib are the words dictated to him by the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi in clarifying legal matters of halal and haram, and that this particular document was also preserved by Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib and passed down through the lines of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salatu wassalam. So in conclusion, my dear friends, and in summary, the followers of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salatu wassalam undoubtedly accept the authority of the whole Qur'an in the way that we have it in front of us today. The Mus'haf of Fatima al-Zahra was a gift given to her by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala via the Archangel Jibra'il in order to offer a sense of consolation. And why not when she has that station in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The Sahifa or the Mus'haf of Ali ibn Abi Talib, excuse me, is the Qur'an of Ali alayhi salatu wasalam that contains his commentary. It is not a different version of the whole Qur'an as some people may perceive. 
And we as followers of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim as salam, like I said before, like every other Muslim legal and theological school, have different reports which speaks to distortion of the whole Qur'an. Every single one of these are rejected. No Shia ulama today believes that the Qur'an itself has the harith that was engaged in it, that there's Qur'anic verses that are missing from the whole Qur'an, and flat out it is a rejection from the uh, unanimous opinion of the followers of Ahlul Bayt. Peace and blessings be upon them. One more salawat with your loudest of voices. And a third time to demonstrate your love. Fatima al Zahra, peace and blessings be upon him. <coughs> My friends, over the last couple of nights, we have been taking a look and tracing the footsteps of Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu salam from the day that he left Medina till the day that he arrived in Mecca. And yesterday, we took a little bit of a break from where Imam al Hussein alayhi salam leaves Mecca to direct himself toward Kufa. And we talked a bit about the story of his representative, Muslim ibn Aqil alayhi salatu salam. But today, I want to go back toward tracing the steps of Sayyid al Shahada al Hussein alayhi salam. We mentioned that as the Hajjaj were leaving for Arafat, Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu salam was going to perform another type of pilgrimage. And we mentioned last night that Muslim ibn Aqil went to go and scope out the situation in the city of Kufa as thousands of letters were written to him asking him to come to Kufa where he would find a stronghold. And we mentioned at the conclusion of our talk last night that the Imam alayhi salam was approached by some well-wishers telling him of the death of Muslim ibn Aqil who was actually killed on the 8th of the month of the Hijjah but the Imam alayhi salatu salam found out some days later. Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu salam set out from Mecca directing his caravan to the city of Kufa. City of Kufa, for those of you who are familiar, who have been for Ziyarah, for instance, who have visited Najaf, is approximately a 10 or 15 minute drive from Najaf, which is the residing place of uh, the commander of the faithful alayhi salatu salam, and approximately I don't know, 80 miles away, 70 miles away from Karbala. Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu salam makes the intention to go toward Kufa. On his way, he takes rest at a nearby city or a nearby village known as Sharaf. At this particular location known as Sharaf, he is intercepted by a man by the name of Hur ibn Yazid al Riyahi. And let me just say this, my dear friends, to open up one very quick parenthesis. I know that the majority of you in this room are familiar with the story of Hur. And every single time we read this particular anecdote, you know, we can build a relationship with this man that runs so deep because there's so much wrong in these hearts of ours, but we still see, again, the mercy and the compassion by the son of the daughter of the messenger of God to him. And we can see a little bit of ourself in his personality. So I want you to walk with me and you see how the heart of Hur was exposed to Imam al Hussein during the course of this journey. Hur al Riyahi is one of the primary and most significant generals of the army of Kufa. And under the authority of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, he was dispatched to finding Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam, such that he does not arrive in Kufa, again, because of a belief that there are thousands of people ready to shed their blood and sacrifice their life for Imam al Hussein. So it is said that Hur al Riyahi, he sees Imam al Hussein and his band of a hundred some odd people, and he comes with the contingency of an army of upwards of 2,000 people, and they surround Imam al Hussein. Imam al Hussein tries to get all of his women, all of his children, his entire army away from the army of Hur, but everywhere they turned, the army of Hur was too large. And 
they were stuck. Khur approaches your Imam, salam Allah alayhi. And he says, O oh, Aba Abdullah, O oh, Imam al Hussein, he says, I have been given instruction to do one of two things. He says, Tell me, O oh, Hur. He says, O oh, Aba Abdullah, either you commit toward pledging allegiance to Yazid ibn Muawiyah, or I will kill you. Imam al Hussein, alayhi salatu wasalam, he looks at Hur dead in the eye and he says, he says, O oh, Hor, may your mother grieve over you. It was like some sort of mocking or insulting his mother. Or as a way that they used to speak back in the day in order to make someone else angry or in order to reprimand them, in order to wake them up a little bit. How do you expect Hor to respond to Aba Abdullah? He says, O oh, Aba Abdullah, if your mother was anyone other than Fatima, I would have said the same back to you. What happens? Hori wakes up. He knows who he's talking to. Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam, turns his face away, knowing very well that Hori is not going to kill him. It is said that he goes, he calms down his, ch- his women, his children, his companions. And a few moments later, it becomes the time of the Adhan of the Dahar prayers. The Adhan is recited. Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam, before he begins to lead his army and his family, his companions in prayers, he says to Hur, he says, Oh Hur, you go on that side of the battlefield, you go on that side of the village, and you lead your army in prayers, and I'll lead my army in prayers over here. What does Hur say? Again, he has something in his heart. He says, Oh Aba Abdullah, you are the son of the daughter of the Messenger of God. We'll all pray behind you. Even though he's tasked with this responsibility, still, he knows who Imam al-Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam is. So at this moment, at this moment, they pray behind the Imam, salam Allah alayhi. There was one other moment that woke up Hur al-Riyahi and exposed him to Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam. There's three. Number one is the moment when he spoke to him about his mother. The second one was at the time of prayers. The third one was that we mentioned that when Hur al-Riyahi captures Imam al Hussein and surrounds him in his caravan. At this moment, there was two, 3,000 members of his army. It is said that there were some from the army of Hur that had gotten lost on the way from Kufa to intercept Imam al Hussein. So it is said that when some of those members finally caught up, they were tired, they were exhausted, it's hot outside, you're riding a, a, a horse, a camel in the desert. That when Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam, saw the members of the army of Hur finally catching up to the rest of their army, even though they were the enemies of Imam al Hussein, he saw that there was thirst on their face. So Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam, himself, he puts water in his hand and he feeds it to them. And then he takes water and he feeds it to the horses. Only days later, those horses would trample on the body of your Imam. Hur al Riyahi is watching all of this unfold in front of his eyes. And numerous instances are made where Hur tries to do his very best to convincing the Imam alayhi salam to, 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 to not pursue this. He says, just pledge allegiance to Yazid, Imam al Hussein, is adamant in saying no. And numerous instances, our books of history, they write including Maqtal of Abi Makhnaf, that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam tried his very best to run away from Hur, tried to get away, tried to scramble away, to direct himself toward Kufa, but every time he attempted to do so, again he was strangled by Hur al Riyahi. Until, until finally, on the 2nd of Muharram, he is diverted from the city of Kufa, and the horse of Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu salam arrives in a sandy, rocky desert. And the horse would no longer proceed. And Hur looks at Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and he says, Let us proceed. He says, My horse is not moving. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he alights from his horse. He picks up some of the sand. He smells some of the sand. Then he goes toward the nearby villagers of this town, of this city, of this community known as Banu Asad. And he says, What do you call this town? What do you call this valley? And they said, O grandson of the Messenger of God, we call it Nainava. 
He says, give me another name. Do you call it another name? They said, oh, Aba Abdullah, we call this Shat al-Furat, the bank of the Euphrates. He says, do you call it another name? And he says, we call this al ghadariya Imam al Hussein says, tell me, is there another name that you attribute to this valley? And they say, oh, Aba Abdullah, we call this land Karbala. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he smells that sand and he states, Hava ardu karbun wa bala. He says, you're right, surely this is the land of trials and tribulations. Ha huna qutila rijaluna. Ha huna, ha, ha huna subia nisa'una. He says, surely this is the land where our men will be killed. This is the land where our children will be orphaned. This is the land where our women will be imprisoned. For those of you who have been to Karbara, take your heart next to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. It is said that they camp nearby that region. Hur al Riyahi, he goes to the other side of the battlefield, waiting for the rest of the army of Amr ibn Sa'ad to arrive in the city of Karbara until the morning of the 10th of Muharram. It is said that the army of Amr ibn Sa'ad, they begin to sharpen their swords. It is almost the time for the Fajr prayer. The Adhan is recited. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he begins to lead his caravan, he begins to lead his family members, his companions in Salatul Fajr. Hur al Riyahi is looking from the opposite side. He's looking at Imam al Hussein pray with the luminous face. He's looking and listening to their adhkar and their worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at the same time, Hur al Riyahi, he is hearing women and children trying of thirst that they're enduring during the course of that day. And it's said at this moment, Hur al Riyahi was holding on to his horse. A man from his army comes to him and says, Oh, Hur, you are our general. If someone were to ask me about the bravest man of Kufa, I would have said that it is you. Why do I see you trembling at this moment? At this moment, he utters his epic line. He says, Inni ara nafsi bayna jannati wa nar. He says, Because I see myself between the gardens of paradise and the fires of hell, and by God, I will not choose anything but paradise. At this moment, that man, he says that I saw Hur al Riyahi taking his horse and he was riding to a unique side of the battle. He was riding to the side, he was riding to the, to the precinct. And at this moment, I thought that he perhaps he went to go and visit the restroom. I had no idea where he was going. And all of, him, all, all of a sudden, I see him slowly approaching the caravan and the tents of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. But I want you to imagine the scene, my friends. Imagine when you've done something wrong to somebody. You want to say sorry to them. You want to be apologetic. How hard is it to say I'm sorry? But none of us committed the sin that Hur did. None of us were responsible for the imprisonment of the children of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. Imagine what type of embarrassment he had to engage in when he was approaching his Imam. You know what happens. You know how he approaches his Imam. He goes and it is said that he alights from his horse and he holds the reins of the horse and he covers his head in embarrassment. He lowers his head. He's wearing his shield. He takes his sword and his spear and turns them upside down pointing toward the ground. And he begins to get closer and closer and closer taking small footsteps. All of a sudden there's commotion in the army of Imam al Hussein. They say, who is this man who's approaching from the army of Amr ibn Sa'ad. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he says, leave this one to me. At this moment, Imam al Hussein exits his tent. He sees Hur in the state, knowing very well who he is. He says, Ya Rajul Man Ant. He says, Oh man, who are you? He doesn't respond. He says, Ya Rajul Man Ant. Who are you, O oh man, who's approaching the daughters of the women of the Messenger of God? He says, I, he, he doesn't respond. A third time he says, Ya Rajul Man Ant. Who are you, O oh man? At this moment, Hur al he falls to the feet of Imam al Hussein. And he says, Ya Aba Abdullah, an al-Ladi ja'ajabik min at Oh Imam al Hussein, I'm the one who took you away from where you wanted to go. I'm the one who's responsible for the widowing of your wives. I'm the one who's responsible for the killing of your children. Oh, Abba Abdullah, will your sister Zainab forgive me? He says, Halli min tawba ya Abba Abdullah. Is there forgiveness for me, O oh, Imam al Hussein? Imam al Hussein alayhi salam falls to the ground. He embraces him. Look at the mercy of the son of the Messenger of God. He states, In tubtab Allah alayk. That if you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness, He will forgive you. My friends, none of us committed the act like that of Har. We have sins, we have errors, we have mistakes. Know that tonight is the night when we can ask for forgiveness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. 
Har al riyahi he embraces Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and he says, Oh Aba Abdullah, since I am the one who brought you here, let me be the first one to go out and fight. It is said that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam accepts. It is says that Har, along with some of his children and his slave as well, they all join the camp of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Har al riyahi he gets on top of his horse, he recites some lines of poetry, then he goes out into the middle of the battlefield and he begins to fight the army of Amr bin Saad. He fights valiantly. He he kills some odd dozen of people and at this moment someone comes and he strikes Hara Riyahi on the head. As he's falling down from his horse he calls out, Assalamu alaykum ya Aba Abdullah. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam rushes out of the whole, rushes out of the tent. He reaches the body of Har al Riyahi. He places the head of Har in his lap. And at this moment, Imam al Hussein says, "O oh, Har, you are free, just as your mother named you, as the soul of Har was leaving his body." But I'll leave you with this, my friends. It is said that on the night of the eleventh of Muharram, when all of the army of Amr bin Saad they began to decapitate and they began to abuse the bodies of all of the companions of Imam al Hussein some of the family of Har was still on the side of Amr bin Sa'ad. So when they went to sever the head of Har, it is said that they protested and they say, this man is from our tribe, he is our uncle, he is our brother, leave the body of Har and let us be the ones who take care of it. But I ask you, what did they do to the head of your master, Imam al Hussein, on the, on, the, on the night of the 11th of Muharram except to sever his... We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the grief in our hearts, tears in our eyes. To allow for us to be amongst those who walk in the footsteps of Muhammad and Wa Muhammad. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us a life that resembles the life of Muhammad and Wa Muhammad and a death that resembles the death of Muhammad and Wa Muhammad. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to never separate us from them in this life and in the barzakh and in the next life. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the ziyara of Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam in this life and in shafa'a in the next life. Bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimeen. Wa sallallahumma ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin. We hope you enjoyed our podcast. If you're inspired by the work that we're doing at the IC and want to help keep it going, subscribe to our podcasts, follow us on social media, Donate to help support us at icnyu.org. And most importantly, keep us in your continued du'as. Until next time, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.